Good morning. Oh, I'm so happy to be home. I have no idea what day it is or what land I'm in, but I'm really happy to be home. I'll be praying for you, Bob. We uh, just came back from France. Woo-woo! And uh, God is moving in France, everybody. Um, we were training missionaries that are actually going to the same area as Bob will be going. Uh, they also go to Kurdistan. So these are young surfers. Hey, you know what? The best kind of person to go to the mission field where it's so dangerous is adrenaline junkies. <laughs> Send the surfers and the snowboarders. So we just came back from uh, Biarritz, France, on the southern coast, where we were uh, working with YWAMers at the Surf and Snow School. I know you think they're not working hard, but they are busting it out there. They just make these kids go out every afternoon and surf. I think uh, it's, it's an amazing thing. They go, want to come to the beach? Nope, no thanks, no thanks. It's about 20 degrees outside? No, no, thank you. And they're out there surfing. I don't care how thick your wetsuit is. No, no bueno. It is freezing cold, and they're out there for hours and hours and hours because, you know what, when you're surfing together in that kind of climate, it builds unity. They do problem solving. They do team building out there in the water. They do it in the snow during the winter months, and then they send them to the Middle East. Just saying, you know, be grateful for your life. <laughs> uh, I am so thankful to be home, Rock of Roseville. I haven't been in church in five months. I'm in church all the time, but I wasn't in this church for five months. Uh, I'm so happy to see my husband. Forget what he looks like when I'm gone. He's filled with grace and mercy for me when I travel, and uh, he prays for me. I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, let me just pray really quick. I want to show you some pictures of just some things God's just been doing in the last month. I think it's... Very important that uh, we are honing in on what God's doing today. Amen? So, Father, I just thank you for this house. I thank you that it is declared a holy place, a place of refuge where your spirit dwells among us. I just thank you for the thickening of your presence right now, Lord. Lord, there's nothing we can do apart from you, so I don't even want to try. I just ask that you come and you give revelation of the grandness of who you are. Overwhelm us today, God, and let the glory of your presence change our mindsets, change our heart position, and heal our soul wounds of any posture of being unseen, forgotten, or unimportant. For you are the God of all glory and all time. You are the uncreated one who dwells in heavenly, holy light, and you call us your children. What better place is there than that? So come, Holy Spirit. Have your way today, and let joy break out, and the gratitude of our hearts bring you much praise this morning. And we love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, do we have some pictures, Nick? I think, uh, do we? Are we? Oh, I just wanted to tell you, uh, we were in New Jersey just before. I, I can't keep track of anything. So uh, we were in France, and then I think we were in New Jersey just before that. So this lady wanders into a meeting, and I don't know where she came from because she doesn't go to either of the churches where we have Indian pastors, and we have um, pastors who come from the Middle East, although they are American, and they partner together and they host uh, a, a conference in the worst part of New Jersey, like what good thing could come from there? Uh, everything, because it's the melting pot of the universe, and all these people from all these countries just wander in, they, they don't, you know, they don't know how they got there, because it's the Holy Spirit. This woman came in, and she had four different uh, certified diseases, and one of them was orthopedic and nerve, she couldn't lift her hands or lift her legs, and she was scheduled to have surgery in 11 days, and she came in, and <laughs> People prayed for her, and then here she is. I, don't, I couldn't find the video of her talking the next day uh, and uh, raising her arms and jumping up and down. And she brought her son in because she barely speaks English. She brought her son in to tell the whole story, and I couldn't find the video. But she, when she walked in, she's, she's like this. She's got canes. And look at her. I mean, this was just this way. Shortly after, she's like this because this is what Jesus does. It's amazing. Can you go to the next one? This is, yeah, you can barely see him, but this is Blossom right here, number 33, and that's Emmanuel, and he's holding their beautiful baby Malachi, and this is Pastor Tiffany Shahid, and uh, 
I will tell you, a year ago, I was in Newark, and I saw this couple sitting in the church. We were doing this conference, and I walked by them. I don't know them, and apparently they had never been to that church either. So this was another one of those situ situations where it's like a Jesus drive-by. That's what I call it. It's a good drive-by. So I walk by, and I go, hey, in 12 months, you're going to hear a baby crying in your house. I don't know them, so I walked on. Well, later, I find out they've been... Uh, told by the doctors they've been in every kind of fertility clinic, every kind of anything for n almost nine years, uh, completely barren. Doctors said, you might as well adopt. And if you could see Malachi's cutest little face, he was dedicated on Sunday. They were pregnant within a month. That's, <laughs> thank you. That's just so great. I, you know, that's the 30th baby that our team has prayed for, for couples who've been certified not to be able to have children. And this couple, isn't that so great? And Tiffany and her husband, Michael Shahid, who are the pastors of, of, of one of these churches that uh, host us every year, they were barren for five and a half years. So the wild thing was we, we had the privilege of praying for them up in their landing because the Lord had given Michael Shahid a word, put an addition on your house, you're going to have a wife and children. He didn't meet the wife for seven years. So he was starting not to believe. How many of you need that today? You need to know God is coming. If he gave you a prophetic promise, which is in his word, he is going to do the thing he said he's going to do. So you need to believe that. They held on, and we stood on the landing of his, his three-bedroom add-on with the two of them, and I said, that's not acceptable. If the Lord gave you a word to put three bedrooms and two bathrooms on, you need some children. So we prayed for them, and they had a baby within a year. Now they're standing there with this couple who just had a baby. Seven babies were born in the Shahid's church the year, that we were, the year after we were there with all these people who were having trouble getting pregnant. So I just want you to know that God is the God of fertility. I know that in church sometimes you're like, don't pray for pregnancies and don't pray for weddings and marriages. I pray for all those things because I believe that Lord doesn't skimp on his promises, amen? So if you're waiting for that, uh, the Lord has your special somebody. He also has a child, somehow, some way. God is a God of miracles, and he does the impossible. Amen? I don't know what else I sent you, so let's see. Oh, there he is. Isn't he so cute? Oh, my gosh. He was so, so cute. It was such an amazing day of dedicating him in that service. And when they dedicated him and, and, and told the story, so many people got healed and nobody prayed for them because that's what happens when faith is released in a room. So good. Okay. I just wanted you to see that, you know, obviously this is the Rock of Roseville. There's no junior Holy Spirit. But wherever we go, we're trying to pull kids in and teach them that they can pray and anoint people. Shortly after this, uh, the power of God just struck this guy, and he fell over backwards, and she just stood there and laughed, which I love. They're like, that was fun. Let's do it again. <laughs> Send them out to pray for people. Okay. Uh, anyway, I want to tell you what's going on with the Catholics. So there is great unity happening globally across this planet right now. There is a breakout anointing on the Catholic Church. I'm so excited because I grew up Catholic. Uh, I'm not sure that this priest knows what to do with me, but um, I am... <laughs> I met this, uh, the right-hand guy of this priest in New Jersey at those other meetings, and uh, he was a former, a former priest, and now he is kind of this guy's right arm. But Jim, I didn't know from anybody, I just walked up to him because the Holy Spirit was on him in a, you know, a crowd about like this, put my hands on him, and he fell out in the Spirit. Then later he came to me and said, hey, I work with this Catholic priest. Do you think you guys would ever come to uh, our church? I said, well, is your priest on board with all this Holy Spirit stuff? He goes, well, he will be. <laughs> don't you love that anyway so I said uh, he was texting me and I said well I'm at I'm a voice of the apostles right now why don't you bring father Jeff with you he goes really I go I'll text Randy Clark and ask him to pray for him he goes are you kidding me I go no Randy loves Catholics so he brings father Jeff and and of course when father Jeff comes in I put him down right next to me and of course this is the he's looking at me like you're you're a bit much but uh Randy Randy Clark and and the whole team our whole agape team ended up praying for him and uh, he had such an encounter with the Lord. And since then, some of our team have gone and ministered in their church. But I will tell you, uh, go ahead and go to the next one. He's a, such, a, such a beautiful man of God. This is on the streets. That's Linda Brown right there, uh, talking and praying for people. And I think the next slide, this is still Voice of the Apostles in, uh, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. This is Father Ubald. Father Ubald is uh, a very high-ranking Catholic priest in Rwanda who is over 80,000 Catholics. 
Father Ubald is determined by the power of the Holy Spirit in his charismatic congregation to bring peace to the people who have suffered through the genocide 25 years ago. He holds stadium events, and they teach on the power of forgiveness. We will be going and joining Father Ubald for two weeks in November to bring more hope and training to the charismatic Catholic people in Rwanda. Amazing, amazing. Let's see what else we got. I don't know if we have a picture. Oh, so we've been doing a bunch of work in San Francisco. I just loved that t-shirt. That's one of the guys on our team. And, uh, and, and we're working with, uh, we are church in San Francisco, right in the city. Uh, that's Francis Chan's ministry and several other ministries there who are determined to unite to end the addiction and the homelessness in San Francisco. So we just feel really privileged to watch what God is doing, unifying different denominations, every place where there has been division. There are people who love the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who are reaching hands out, hearts out, to bring unity to the one body of Christ that the Bible talks about. We are not several fractions, we are one. I don't know what else uh, is there. Uh, that's just, I just wanted to put that up because it was Aaron, because Aaron was talking, <laughs> talking when we were down with We Are Church. I don't know if there's anything left there. Is that it? We good. So I want to talk to you today. You know, I, I, could, I could preach on gratitude all day long because nobody's more grateful than me that I don't have pain every day. Um, nobody's more grateful than me that I get a front row seat to watch what God's doing across this amazing planet. And you know, it's easy to get bogged down with all the stuff you got going on in front of you, but when you get to travel and you get to see in places where everybody said it was hopeless or don't go there or why would you bother, uh, when, he, when God has marked a place for his name, he's just looking for anyone willing. And that's true. If he's going to send me, he would send anyone. I just say yes. Uh, we'll be going to Argentina, working with another charismatic order with 60,000 Catholics in September. Uh, we will be going back to Switzerland where there's groundbreaking stuff happening. Every month there's revival meetings going on in places in the finance capital of, of the world where everybody said they don't, you know, it's less than 1% believes in God. But there's one woman there who's like, I don't care. I'm still going to do it. So she continues to plow the ground and do this thing. And she's got everybody who's moving on the planet coming there because she won't stop. So they tell her to be quiet, she gets louder. She doesn't care. And they're generous people, so people give them favor. Generosity is a kingdom principle like honor is a kingdom principle. When you are honoring and you're generous, doors open. So when you are trying to plow some hard ground, try generosity, try honor, even if you don't agree with them. It's not manipulation. All right, so um, I don't, is there an Anthony in here or a Tony in here? Who's Anthony? Tony, where? Oh my gosh, it's you! Okay, Anthony, come up here. Bring your beautiful wife with you. Yeah. Cut, can you cut the live feed? I, I,
a Bible? Yep. Open it. 2 Timothy 2.4. 2 Timothy 2.4. Thank you, Lord. Okay, um, I'm going to share a word about kingdom. I'm really camping on, on earth as it is in heaven these days. Because even though I see the Lord do great things, I know he is certainly capable of doing so much more. And uh, perhaps he's limited by moi. So I don't want to be the stumbling block in his way. I want to be the wide open space he can walk on. So this morning, we're going to start with 2 Timothy 2.4. And I'm going to read you the ESV as well as the Passion Translation. And it says this in the ESV, a soldier refrains from entangling himself in civilian affairs in order to please the one who enlisted him. Let me go to the Passion Translation. For every soldier called to active duty must divorce himself from the distractions of the world so that he may fully satisfy the one who chose him. So I opened up the word one morning and I'm sitting there looking at that verse and I'm thinking about it and I'm praying through it and I hear the word mired, which is not a word I use. So I'm like, I'm game good. Teach me, Lord. That's how we roll. I write things down and he teaches me because the Holy Spirit teaches us all things. First John 2, 27. When you are paying attention and you are still, which I'm not always good at, but I'm trying. So as I'm listening to this word, I don't know if, if that's a word that you use, but I felt that the Lord impressed on me that mired is what happens to me, maybe to you, when the weight of living in this world becomes my focus instead of the truth that comes from living out of my relationship with and through Christ. To be mired is this. It's to be stuck, bogged down, and even smeared with entanglements. I definitely resembled that remark that morning. And some of you are like, well, you travel all over. Yeah, and we get tired. And then our attitude goes, bing, left, really far left sometimes. Yesterday even, it did. I knew how much I had been imitating something, and it wasn't the Lord in that day. So it doesn't work when we imitate the world and just add Jesus on top, everybody. It doesn't work. The word's clear, we can't serve two masters, right? Matthew 6, 24. So if I or you regard wealth, power, and position as an object of my worship and devotion and all my time and my energy and resources go to those things, then I'm serving what the Bible says is the God of mammon. So you're like, whoa, whoa, that's a little extreme. But okay, how about this? When we, when I feel unseen and underappreciated or anxious about my future or my worldly position, then that's what's influencing me, right? Can we, are we, are we okay with that? Okay, um, but if I'm frustrated with my finances or I think that I'm not be, being given opportunities or respect to lead like I think I deserve or to influence, then I've perhaps fallen under cultural relevance. Just speaking truth, right? I mean... It happens, doesn't it? I mean, it happens to me. It depends on where I am. And if, if money and, and status and power are all around me, I can get smeared with that, can't I? I, I can. And, and I tend to measure, maybe you do too, according to the standards of culture rather than kingdom. If I'm in it, I don't have to dwell there though because our heavenly father, almighty God, Yahweh, owns all the power. Say power. He owns all the wealth, and he owns all the influence. Yeah, and you know what? He holds us as believers in the highest position as heirs of his. What is my problem? I need to know that in and out, in and out, every day. Money is not the evil thing, nor is power nor his influence. But when I labor to self-promote or obtain wealth and position apart from God, then I'm no longer serving him. I see it all over the world. It's called manipulation and it's witchcraft. When we try to promote ourselves subtly, we're masterful at it too, right? Try to promote ourselves in a place where pick me, pick me, pick me, see me, know me. Those things cannot sustain 
Because if you wiggle yourself in there, you got to forever wiggle yourself and hold yourself up. It's exhausting. Let God promote you. He sees you. He loves you. My goodness, he loves you so much. And, and the day that he was, he was talking to me about all this, it was Labor Day. I started laughing. I was like, what? Labor Day? He goes, how's it going for you? I go, yeah, clearly not good. I go, what is the matter with me today? He said, you gave out more than you soaked up. Ooh, yes, absolutely did that. I did that. Why did I do that? Uh, I'm still working on that. You know, all kinds of reasons, uh, but none of them good. None of them good. You know, the Lord labored so that we would have freedom in ours. And I just forgot that. And you know, Christianity is not a pleasure cruise. Maybe yours is at the moment. Yay! Hallelujah. Sometimes it's a difficult path, but you know, this difficult path that we walk on, everybody, the Bible is very clear that we can still walk it out with bliss and joy despite our circumstances. It's possible, and it's not denial and stupidity. It's choice. Because even when I lived in hell with all that nerve damage and pain for 15 years, I was still quite joyful most of the time. Not every day, but most of the time, because I had to choose who I was going to serve. So we know that the word says his yoke is easy and his burden is light, right? So when we come to him, we find what? Rest for our souls, right? Do you have rest today? Some of you really, really need it. When I was in so much pain, the only rest I ever had was in him. And I was so addicted to him because I couldn't survive without him how quickly that goes away when you find your self-sufficiency in yourself. You're suddenly like, uh-oh, how'd I get way out here? Where's Jesus? We need to remain at his feet continually. And when we lose our way, we come right back to him because he said, I overcame what? The world for you. So be of good cheer. Because I already defeated the obstacles. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Are you facing an obstacle today? Nobody? Just me. Okay, that's good. Me and Brandon. You'll go through seasons, right? And, and there will be valleys. And then there will be these great mountaintop experiences. And so today I'm asking the Holy Spirit to take me out of this rutted thinking I have. This unmucking, this... This, this mired, stuck place. Because let me tell you what the antonyms of mired are, and you might have a, wow, listen to that. These are the antonyms. Free, uncomplicate, untangle, liberate, release, let go, untwist, clean, remove. Does that sound like what Jesus came for? That's exactly what he came for. And Isaiah 61 declares that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to what? Preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up who? The brokenhearted. To proclaim freedom for who? The captives. And release from darkness who? The prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. We are comforting all who mourn, are we? That's what we're called to do, to bring the good, it's good news, bring the good news and provide for those who grieve, to bestow on them a crown of what? Beauty instead of ashes and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And then they, we, will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. He said it all right there. Heal the broken hearts, set the captives and the prisoners free, comfort those who are grieving, depressed and in despair, and boy, do we need that good news in the next generation. I just got a text message from my friend who is like this <laughs> undercover covert ops agent in a Chicago high school. She's the head of the history department, and she prays for all the students there, 5,000 students 
in a, a not great area of Chicago. She just texted me 159 students are declared suicidal out of a class of 500 incoming freshmen. She said, please pray for me. I said, I'm praying for you all the time. But I know that this spirit of death has no chance with you in that school. I have, <laughs> she has a club called Breakthrough, which she is uh, not technically in charge of. She puts the kids in charge of everything. And uh, people like me go and minister there. And the Holy Spirit breaks out. And all these kids, many of them uh, are first generation Americans. Their parents don't speak English. They call their parents and they say, Jesus is here, come down. We pray for their parents. Their parents get healed. I mean, you're talking about deafness and blindness. I mean, crazy stuff goes on in the school at 3.30. Jesus only needs one person. Come on. He only needs one person. I love Christina. She cracks me up. She has two master's degrees. She could be making all kinds of money in all kinds of other fields. But her mission field are high schoolers in inner city Chicago. And she has been doing it for 18 years. She's changing the world. And when she's off in the summer, she goes into the prisons. <laughs> I aspire to be Christina one day. When she goes into the prisons, even the warden lines up. Because the Holy Spirit rolls in and the guards get healed and the prisoners get set free. Only takes one of us, everybody. Matthew 5.14 says, Your lives light up the world. Let others see your light from a distance. For how can you hide a city that stands on a hilltop? And then to 16, 516 of Matthew. Let light shine brightly before others so that the commendable things you do shine as light upon them and they will give their praise to your Father in heaven. That's what happens when Christina prays for these kids. She has a whole team come in there and then their families come in because the children cannot help but declare the glory of the Lord when he touches them. They call their parents and say, get down here right now. Ephesians 5, 8 through 10 says, once your life was full of sin's darkness, but now you have the very light of our Lord shining through you because of your union with him. Your mission, my mission, is to live as a child flooded with his revelation light and the supernatural fruit of his light will be seen in us. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. And then we will learn to choose what is beautiful. To the Lord. First is the action, then you choose. So when I become, when you become entangled in civilian affairs, that's anything that's not kingdom of heaven related. When I agree the obstacles I'm facing or the weight of my struggles have greater power than Christ, my light is dulled and I'm mired by those things that concern the enemy. My holy position, your holy position as the heir of Christ is to be given his full power. Say full power. Full, power. full authority. Say full authority. full authority. But when we believe we are powerless, it happens, doesn't it? When we believe we're powerless because of these worldly struggles, we have lost sight of the totality of who he is and what the atonement paid for. Jesus is the Christ. Some people in church think Christ is Jesus' last name. Hey, I've been to them. They don't know what they don't know, so let's tell them, amen? He is the fullness of God. In every way, he is the Father's likeness. In Hebrews 1.3, it says the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature upholding all things by his powerful word. And he has provided purification of sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. When you feel overwhelmed, if Jesus and the Holy Spirit are interceding for you, that's two-thirds of the Trinity. How can you lose? I'm telling you, Jeremiah 33 is like a piercing in my heart. I don't know most days. I'm like, help me, Jesus. Jeremiah 33, 3 says... Call to me and I'll tell you great and unsearchable things you don't know. Every single day I'm like, I don't know anything. Help me. Standing in front of these crowds of people like, ah, what? 
Bob. It'll be next week for you, baby. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, verse 11. I just want you to see something very important and make a note in your margin. Or on your phone. Okay. So Luke 2, in the 11th verse, it says this, very important. For today is born to you in the city of David, the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Usually you only hear that at Christmas, don't you? You're getting it a little early. So it can be translated, for today is born to you in the city of David, the Savior, who is Master Yahweh, the Mashiach. Have you ever heard that word? Mashiach. It's, it is uh, spelled M-A-S-H-I-Y-A-C-H. So the Mashiach is the anointed one or the messianic prince. And the reason why I wanted you to see that is because it also means the consecrated one according to 2 Samuel 1.21, Daniel 9.25, Leviticus 4.3. Mashek, this Mashek, this word means to smear, to smear with oil or to anoint, okay? Yak means God. Have we got that? So to be smeared with God. That's Jesus. Are you getting it? All right. 39 times in the Old Testament, the mention of the Mashek is always God Yahweh doing the anointing. Jesus is God. So he sends his only son to be the anointing for us. And when Jesus departs, he says, I'm leaving you my Holy Spirit. It's better that I go away. Because the Holy Spirit is the anointing of the Christ that is in us. Are you getting it? Watch this. Yahweh is the real Mashiach. God the Father chose the vessel of Yeshua. Jesus, the man. According to Colossians 2.9. So within Yeshua, I think we're all in agreement, the full dwelling of the one divine nature of Yahweh is in the Christ. Amen? All right, no lack. And the Holy Spirit is the Ruach HaKodesh, which is this divineness, the oneness of God in the presence that lives within these fallible human beings. Is your mind blown? Every day it should be. Because you don't have to work it up, fix it up, get it right. Just step out and be kind. And watch God back you up. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Kindness is so underrated. Everybody's like, well, that wasn't a miracle. Well, yes, it was. It's the first kind word that person's heard in 12 years. We go through airports and smile at people, and they're like, we say thank you to the clerks in the stores. We smile at them. Sometimes we pray for them. Sometimes they get healed. But to be kind is to be Jesus. The literal meaning of the fullness of Yahweh dwelling in Christ is in Isaiah 53, 1 through 4. I want you to see this. Isaiah 53, 1 through 4. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root and dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care, yet it was our weakness, all of our weakness, that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. And you know, John chapter one, verse 14, that the word became flesh, right? And the flesh dwelt among us because we have seen now his glory, glory as the son from the father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus chose you and me to be these divine vessels. Turn to your neighbor and says, that means you. That's why there's a war on, everybody. Because the first thing that renders us impotent is doubt. Couldn't have possibly meant me. I mean, that's for those people who go around the world like Bob. 
Those are the brave ones. I'm just going to stay in my cubicle and do my work. 2 Timothy 2.4, we started there. For every soldier called to active duty must divorce himself from the distractions of the world so he may what? Fully satisfy the one who chose him. The greatest weapons of warfare are doubt and fear. That's it. I mean, you know, I, we just finished clarifying we're smeared with Jesus. But you can be so smeared with fear that you forget about the smearing of Jesus. If he calls us his kingdom priests, he says, you are dripping with anointing. Psalm 133 talks about that. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. And the oil, the anointing of Aaron, the high priest, the anointing comes down and drips into his robe. That's what you get when you honor people. And you're generous. You promote unity. And then we see the anointing of God growing in a region. When I came in here, he, he, the Lord gave me Psalm 122. And there's, in, in verse 3, it talks about being a city, uh, Jerusalem being a, being a city of this great light, this great anointing. And that's what he was saying about the Rock of Roseville. That, that there has been a lot of endurance over the years. And this is the season of harvest. This is the season of breakthrough. This is the season where the impoverished of mind, body, and spirit within our community begin to understand that Christ is for them, died for them, and they begin to give the church another chance. Because the people of God in this church know how to love and be kind. And in that, they will see hope. And when hope rises, faith is birthed, and people begin to encounter God in a new way. So when we are mired in this world, we are smeared with the entanglement of sin, whether we are the one sinning or the one being sinned against. And it happens, doesn't it? But this is not our place of residence. Hallelujah! Come on! We are smeared with the anointing of Jesus Christ and given everything. Say everything. everything. To stand no matter what type of worldly pollution you just stepped into. You've been given everything. I've been given everything to stand. So listen to Colossians 2, verses 8 through 10 in the message version, because it just smacked me right in the head when I read it. And I just thought I would share. So. Watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. They want to drag you off into endless arguments that never amount to anything. They spread their ideas through the empty traditions of human beings and the empty superstitions of spirit beings. But that's not the way of Christ. Everything of God gets expressed in him so you can see and hear more clearly. You don't need a telescope, a microscope, or a horoscope. Love that line. To realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without him. Amen? When you come to him, that fullness comes together for you too. His power extends over everything. Yeah. All right, I'm going to finish up with this. Peter's revelation of Christ has a huge bearing on this message. And in Matthew 16, it's very, very telling. At verse 13, it says this in the Passion. When Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples this question. What are people saying about me, the son of man? Who do they believe I am? Don't they always make you feel better about yourself, these disciples and their answers? Love these guys. I read them when I'm feeling really bad about myself. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'm right there. <laughs> they answered, some are convinced that you are John the baptizer. Others say you're Elijah reincarnated or Jer Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he turns and he goes, but you, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter spoke up and said, you are the anointed one, the son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus replied, You are favored and privileged, Simeon, son of Jonah, for you didn't discover this on your own, but by my Father in heaven, he has supernaturally revealed this to you. I give you the name Peter, a stone, and this truth of who I am will be the bedrock foundation on which I will build my church, my legislative assembly. This is important. And the power of death will not be able to overpower it. 
I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven and to release on earth that which is released in heaven. Are you a kingdom people? Amen. You cannot, I cannot learn more and more information about Jesus and expect to be transformed in my thinking. I'm not saying don't study the Bible. Study the Bible and encounter the Holy Spirit because it's both. We can't just learn information because Jesus says to Peter, you are blessed, Peter, because you were given revelation by my Father in heaven. How does that happen? It only happens through intimacy. So if I'm not in an intimate connection, how do I expect to have revelation? Because from this point in time in history, Jesus declares upon the revelation of his true position as the one and only Messiah, the entire church will be built and all supernatural power and authority from the heavenly realm is released. Come on, church. It's not a one-time thing. I gave my life to Christ and here I am. And what are you doing? I gave my life to Christ. Use me, God. I don't know what I'm doing. Help me. But use me. Use me in my workplace. Use me to change my family. Use me to love that person in front of me who just did something horrible. Use me, God, right where I am. Empowerment, everybody, comes through the revelation of who Christ is on a moment-by-moment basis. I can't possibly tell you enough that I I need a daily revelation. I need that. I cannot do my life. I can't do my family. I can't do this mission assignment if I don't have that. And some days I'm so tired and I think I have nothing and I lay on my face until he comes because I need something and the something is Jesus. And so do you, wherever you are. I didn't come in here today to condemn. I came here to encourage you. Wherever you are, you are a light on a hill. Wherever you are, you're a transformation agent of Christ for your kindness, through your words, through your simple, obedient actions. Not as a slave, but as a chosen vessel. As a chosen vessel. God. When God said, when Jesus told Peter, on your revelation, I'll build my legislative assembly. Do you understand that all the governmental authority in the heavenly kingdom is given to the church? All of it. I don't care who's in office. I don't care. Do you pray for them? Please do. Nothing gets by the Lord. You know, I'm not going to mention any names, but people didn't get into office and it just sort of slipped by. Gosh, Lord, didn't you see that guy that got elected? Oh my gosh. The Lord knows. Pray for them. Not one leader is beyond the touch and the reach of Jesus Christ. If God gave us the keys to the kingdom to forbid here what is forbidden in heaven, then we can do that. If God gave us the keys of the kingdom to release what is already released in heaven, then we can do that. Because when you talk about a life in Christ, it's a life hidden away in intimacy. But then out of that, signs, wonders, and miracles follow you. And you're like, I've never had that. Well, today's your day. When you go from this church, There's a whole hurting world out there. Most of them have never even heard the name Jesus. You don't have to live in Cambodia for somebody not to know the name of Jesus. You can live in Roseville, California. They don't know. When you go on in the scriptures and you see that upon Jesus, on his shoulder, there is the key of the house of David and that which the Lord has opened, not one person can shut. It's destiny, everybody. It will happen with or without us. Don't you want to get in? Don't you want to do that? We're just jars of clay, and we're leaking all the time. I'm a big leaker. If he says you're a vessel of divine light, then that's what you are. 
So I don't know, uh, you know, what happened over the holidays. For some of you, you don't have the most functional families. Welcome to planet Earth. <laughs> so, so I get that. Some of you are like, huh. And then you got Christmas coming up, you're like, uh, here we go. I get it. I totally get it. But you don't know how powerful you are. You know, sometimes in my own family, my very presence can be, uh, what's the word? It may be overwhelming. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. That's why both of us aren't going to Iraq, because it would be incredibly overwhelming for them if Bob and I are in the same place. You know, to, to be a person who doesn't become entangled in the whole civilian affair thing would mean that you need to know what to do with your hurt. You know, I, I am not suggesting you, you don't pay attention to that. I, I'm suggesting get it healed up quick and move along. Because truly, in your own family, uh, if nobody else is a believer, who, who's going to bring the revelation? You know, you can look over your shoulder all you want, but I'm sure it's on you. Yeah, that, that was heavy, huh? Some of you are like, no, <laughs> I don't receive that. Yeah, well, welcome. The thing that we do is we continue to do things the same way and expect a different result, and that's insanity in my book. Jesus is the all-sufficient, all all-creative all creative one, and he's got a new way to approach your family, your business place, your boss whatever it is that you're facing, and you go, I can't even be Christian here. Really? No, you can, because you can be kind. And when you are kind, people go, wow, how come you're smiling and you're kind? Because I know how much God loves me. And you know what? God loves you too. And you don't have to get all religious. Come on. That's what it makes everybody go, Wah. you know. In the places of my family where people don't believe there is a God, it's been really tough sometimes when I am visiting. But in those places, I simply do what God has asked me to do. And, you know, I do it with fear and trembling. And, I, and I'm not such a willing candidate sometimes. But when I do it, I'm always shocked at how the atmosphere starts to shift and how God says, watch, watch, watch this. And then the person who is the staunch atheist goes, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, did anyone else see what just came out of that person's mouth right there? Tell us about some of your miracles on your trips. What? I thought you didn't believe in God. No, but I want to hear the stories. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you stand up? I'm going to have our agape team and our rock prayer team come to the front. <laughs> Listen, everybody. What I would really love to ask of you is that you would begin to pray that Roseville, Rockland, Lincoln, Citrus Heights, all of Placer and Sacramento counties would catch fire like what I am witnessing down in San Francisco. A couple of months ago, I was down in the Tenderloin. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's a, an area of San Francisco that is besieged with addictive addictions and homelessness. Uh, nobody will count the homeless because I think they're afraid to know. I, I think, personally, it's probably around 35,000 people now. Um, people are shooting up right in front of you on the street, black tar heroin. It's a death trap. And, and I was so outraged because I said, where are the people of God? And I was told by the pastors who are so beat up down there, we, we just can't keep people down here. It's just so hard. And I said, well, what is the success rate of getting these people off the street? And they said less than 1%. I said, come on, we need, we don't need an army we need the church, who, is the, who are all the lovers of God, to come down here who are armed and equipped to understand how to do what Isaiah 61 said we could do, set these people free. Because they are held captive yes. through the power of addiction. 99.8% of all addicted homeless people have had childhood trauma. Do you understand that? That's our Center for Disease Control who said that they don't even believe in Jesus church we are the answer to people's prayers we are the hope that's rising for a hopeless generation we are the carriers of divine light who are bringing freedom 
So many of you in here got set free. I was one of them. I owe Christ my life. And he made a straight way for us to walk. He's just looking for your simple yes. No condemnation. Today's the day. So close your eyes. And there's no coercion, you know, that, that, that's just, that's jacked up. There's no coercion. It's just simplicity. The gospel is simply the good news. Salvation for eternity and freedom. Walking in the fullness of Christ right now. So if there's anybody in here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I invite you to come down front and let one of our prayer team pray with you. Do not let this day pass you by. Because I can tell you the freedom that Christ bought for you will transform everything about you. And you will be the person you were born to be. Because it's only possible in Him. And if you came in here today and you're like, well, Joe, that's all good for you. You don't know my life. I don't. But I know Jesus does. And I know that he overcame everything that you have ever walked through and everything that you will walk through. So I'm just going to ask you to hold your hands out. Brandon and Leon uh, saw something similar that I saw upstairs. But first we're going to pray a prayer. And then I really believe in the power of kindness, or I wouldn't talk about it so much today. I believe in the power of hugs. A lot of times we watch demons flee and people get healed of all kinds of diseases through a hug. I love how Jesus works. So I don't know what your obstacles are. I don't know what you're afraid of. I don't know uh, what, what is the deal. Maybe you're already walking in all of it, but maybe you need more. So I just simply want you to repeat just super simple prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea where I'm going. And I have no understanding of how much you want to use me. But I am ready for you to use me up. My life is yours. I lay down my fear, my judgment, and my preconceived ideas of what Christian life looks like. I lay down my opinion that the only people crazy enough to go to Iraq are people like Bob and Joe. Lord, if you want me to go to Iraq, I'll go. If you want me to go to India, I'll go. If you want me to go to Rockland, into a dry cleaning store and prophesy over the clerk, I'll do it. If you want me to go volunteer at the dog shelter and minister to those people, I'll do it. If you want me to be kind at the grocery store, even during the holidays, when there's a long line, I will. If you want me to pay for somebody's groceries, I'll do that too. Lord, make me generous. Make me a person of honor. And make me bold for you. So, Father, I thank you that you dwell in marvelous light. And just ask for an increase to come upon your people this morning. And I just hear the Lord say, there is no hindrance, there is no obstacle, there is no mountain, I didn't already move for you. Walk forward, walk forward, and look at where I am directing you. So I'm gonna release you to come to the front. If you need additional prayer for physical healing, emotional breakthrough, a blessing over your family, if you have children and grandchildren, I am challenging you to invite these children to pray for the sick because there is breakthrough when children pray. Whatever you need, we release the front for prayer. And for the rest of you that need to go, we bless you, we bless you, and we ask the Holy Spirit right now 
by His divine appointment to show you where today you are to minister. Because believe me, He has appointments for you. So we praise you, God. We thank you, Lord. And we love you. We give you all glory, all honor, and praise. Give the Lord a shout and thanksgiving this morning. Great is He. Great is He.